So, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to our event here, Plastic Particles of Hope. And I want to first start by acknowledging we are on the traditional unceded territory of the Coastal Salish people, specifically the um, Kwantlen, Katsi, and uh, Stalo peoples. And we're just thankful to be on this beautiful land here. And I'm going to introduce Richard Chandra, who's our Vice Provost of Research. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here in person, but um, he gave us a video that really explains the whole concept of sustainability and also the, uh, the funding that's sustaining these events. So uh, I'm going to introduce Richard, who's going to come up on the video now. Thank you all for coming. My name is Richard Chandra. I'm the Associate Provost of Research at Trinity Western University. And I regret that I can't be at this very important event in person. Well, when we think about sustainability, we hear everyone talk about it, but what does sustainability mean? Merriam-Webster defines sustainability as of relating to or being a method of harvesting or using a resource so that the resource is not depleted or permanently damaged. More practically, sustainability means using resources to meet our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. As a researcher myself, I've worked on sustainability in renewable energy and materials for the past 25 years, and I'm extremely passionate about us striving to ensure that resources will be available for our future generations. Sustainability for us individually means that we have to examine our lifestyle and make conscious choices and take a few extra seconds to think what are the consequences when I throw that plastic container away instead of recycling it? What are the consequences if I drive 50 plus kilometers to work every day when I have the chance, the, the choice to work from home? What are the consequences if I fly all the way across the world to attend a one day meeting? We have to take this time to think whether we want our carbon footprint to be a size five or a size 15. Researchers such as those you will hear from today are doing such important work affecting sustainability for future generations. Recognizing the importance for, of research in sustainability, TWU applied for the Supporting Structures Grant, which is aimed at supporting innovative collaborations to enhance STEM research at the Council for Christian Colleges and University member campuses, the CCCU. TWU is grateful to have been awarded the grant funded by the CCCU and the Scholarship for Christian Scholars at Oxford University and the Murdoch Trust. And this grant will be used to support research at Trinity Western in the area of sustainability. Today, we will hear from researchers who are working hard to make a difference in the efforts to help preserve our lifestyle for future generations. Everyone benefits from empty landfills, clean water and air, and abundant clean energy. These researchers also need all of our help to take those few extra seconds to think, what size of carbon footprint do I want to make? Thank you very much for coming and for the speakers for sharing their important research today. Blessings to you. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Shane Durbach uh, to our proceedings today. Uh, I've known Shane for just under two years now. Uh, he's an associate professor of chemistry uh, here at Trinity Western. And please congratulate him afterwards. He has just recently been granted tenure at Trinity Western. So congratulations, Shane. Now, Shane came to us from South Africa. Um, he got his PhD at the University of Johannesburg. And his other studies were, and I wrote this down because I know I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, the University of the Witwatersrand. There we go. Okay. Um, he's actually received, as part of a team, a couple of teaching awards at that university, and I can guarantee that in the relatively near future, Shane is bound to get one here. I've visited his classes. He's really an amazing teacher. Um, for his research, um, he shows a lot of care for sustainability and for the stewardship of God's creation in everything he does. Uh, he works with shaped carbon nanomaterials, uh, which have a number of applications, um, including uh, possibly low-cost building materials and converting carbon dioxide to fuels. Um, 
With all of these accomplishments in sustainability, however, there's one aspect of sustainability that Shane has not been able to, to take into account, and that is his receding hairline. Uh, and I hope he solves that problem soon, because I have a feeling I'm not very far behind him on that road. So everyone, please welcome Professor Shane Durabai. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Glenn. Um, yes, I think we will have to do something about the receding headline. Um, but nonetheless, um, thank you for that. And thanks for the congratulations. All right, so the title of the presentation is about the particles of, of hope, the plastic particles of hope in particular, the area that we are researching, really looking at the rerouting of plastics that were de destined for landfills and for uh, oceans and so on to a production of shaped uh, carbon materials. They're nano and micro, so they're, they're both ranges there. So just a correction there. It's not just nano that we're looking at. And the idea is to use them for composites to prevent uh, corrosion in pipelines, in particular water, sewage, and so on. The team um, that we've assembled as we're going along in terms of the research uh, from Trinity is myself and Dr. Onyango. And I'll, I'll let you know a little bit about what she's uh, planning on doing. It's a newer development that we're doing. Uh, Dr. Jacob Mutu uh, from the University of Regina in Saskatchewan, and, and then also Dr. Zakona Tatana in uh, South Africa at the University of Edwards Rand, my former uh, university. So quickly to let you know what the title, uh, what the kind of outline of this talk is going to be so that you have a sense of where we're going and where we're going to land. Uh, first, I'm going to go through a brief introduction to, to plastics. I know uh, people kind of get a bit surprised when you realize how far back it actually goes. Um, and then to start looking at where are we getting our plastics today, because that profile is starting to change, but unfortunately he still has a history uh, um, associated with it. We want to look at some of the problems that are associated with plastics, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the media things that have been said about plastics and so on, so you have a good idea about that, but I want to expand that a little bit so you have a sense of why we're trying to do the research that we're doing. Then I will look at a little bit on what kind of remediation is done, and this is the area where I think we should hopefully get some hope. Uh, because once you've seen that the actual area of the problem, you can actually start to wring your hair out if you have any. Then I want to do a little bit of a summary of what it is we're doing. The research is still relatively new, having started only within the last seven months. Uh, some of the undertones of the work does take uh, uh, into account previous work that I've done in South Africa. Um, but some of the stuff we've done since then is new. And then some thanks and acknowledgments, so that you get a sense of, of who has contributed towards the research. So just a brief history of, of the plastics. As I said, it was, it's quite a surprise to discover that the first plastics were in 1862. We kind of think of plastics as being a modern thing, uh, something that's happened in the last you know, 50 years or so, but actually it goes back a little bit further than that. So the first development of plastic uh, called Pakistan, uh, which was exhibited in England, um, was an attempt to try and replace ivory and, uh, and horn. Of course, the way that they were doing that is by killing elephants and rhinos. And the reason why they were worried is not because they were killing elephants or rhinos, it's because the supply was low. All right, so we've changed in our thinking. Uh, in 1869, um, uh, John Wesley Hyatt actually uh, purchased the patent that came from Alexander Parks because Alexander Parks hadn't managed to commercialize it that well. And he then actually uh, pushed it to a more uh, larger scale manufacturer. And again, there, the idea was to replace uh, the materials used for billiard balls, which was ivory. Eight, uh, uh, 1907, uh, Bakelite. Uh, Bakelite was, was developed primarily because uh, with uh, the electrification in the US, you needed uh, something that was strong, it was durable, and was an insulator. And so that was developed then. It was only until the 1920s or thereabouts that the theory behind what a polymer is actually stand, uh, started to come into, in, into account. Here, uh, the researcher, the German researcher, actually started to realize that there were two classes of what he referred to as macromolecules or big molecules. And those were naturally occurring and those that were synthesized. He said that the, these polymers or these macromolecules were made up of smaller units that basically repeated themselves over and over again. And uh, that understanding 
allowed us, one, to understand DNA, for example, but also to understand how to make polymers and what kinds of polymers we could make. Thereafter, we had uh, things like polyvinyl chloride in 1926, 1933, polyethylene, uh, well kept secret because it was being used for radar uh, cables to protect the, ra uh, the, the, the cables themselves. Um, of course, there was a uh, moving, uh, moving towards where the Second World War was starting. Um, so all of that stuff has been kept uh, pretty much uh, under wraps. Plexiglass for aircraft again. So you see a lot of the applications initially were associated with war and war efforts. Um, in 1935, you see the development of nylon, synthetic uh, fiber that looks like synthetic uh, uh, silk. It was used for things like parachutes and, and so on. Surprisingly, although Teflon was invented in uh, 1838, uh, um, there, there weren't a lot of real applications until later on because it was extremely expensive to make. And so today, it's, very, it's plentiful. We think of it as something that was, it's been used like this all the time, but it actually wasn't. Then 1941, we saw polystyrene reinvented. Surprisingly, it was actually about 1868, somewhere around there when it was first invented, but then they didn't know what to do with it. So, uh, the reinvention then uh, landed up with uh, expanded polystyrene, which we now know as styrofoam. And who has not had takeouts before in styrofoam? So we know that this is plentiful. Thereafter, there was a whole plethora of, of polymers that were developed. High density polyethylene, HDPE, uh, bisphenol A, polycarbonates, the things that you drink water, the bottles you drink water out of, polypropylene, uh, and Kevlar to stop you from dying if somebody shoots you. So, the, the thing that was underlying this was the development of materials which people thought were going to produce an abundant wealth. They were feeling this is, you know, we're at the cusp of utopia. And uh, these materials were inexpensive, they were safe, they were flexible, uh, and you could actually use them for a whole range of things. And I just want to point out that word safe there, because that was an underlying assumption that was made about these plastics as they were being developed. And of course, there's a whole host of them that come from, uh, from there. So the question we wanted to ask is, okay, well, so where do plastics come from today? Well, um, as the images indicate there, you can kind of tell straight away where they, where they are coming from. I know that it's not that clear, but the green the line that's on here seems to indicate the small quantity that's now coming from what we refer to as bi biopolymers, but the great majority of that, 98% of that, actually comes from the, uh, the oil industry and fossil fuel industry. And so that's an that's a unfortunate circumstance. So what do they do? Well, typically what happens is if you, if you uh, extract the oil or, or get the uh, natural gas, the, let's take, for example, crude oil. Crude oil then is broken down into smaller particles. Those are then chemically transformed. These particles or these uh, chemicals are then the starting blocks or the monomers. The, the theory developed in the 1920s, they're the monomers produced large-scale or macro-scale molecules or, or polymers. For example, uh, here with um, ethylene, uh, if you then use chemical means, you can then make poly, uh, polyethylene. So these polymers were developed for their particular uh, properties. So for example, is it moldable? Is it, is it uh, thermally stable? Is it tough? And so on. So that's really the driving force that went uh, uh, behind that process. So you see, we have a whole range of them now, and we've classed them according to how recyclable they are. There's seven groups of them, and I'm sure Tim a little bit later on is going to talk about some of those groups. And you can get a sense from the image on, images on the screen there what kinds of applications these are for, ranging from uh, drinking bottles all the way to storage containers and so on. The first six over there are what we refer to as thermoplastic. Thermo, heat, and plastic. So the idea there is that when you heat these plastics up, they become gooey and sticky and moldable, so you can actually change their shape. But the nice part about that is that theoretically you should be able to get them to set into a structure and then collect them again, make them gooey, moldy, shapeable, and then another structure and so on. So there should theoretically be this process where we're at, at no stage are we wasting the plastic. We're constantly recycling it into other forms. The group seven there's a little bit trickier. Group seven are a lot harder to recycle, and um, things like your uh, car tire, uh, vehicle tires, so uh, acrylonitrile, butadiene, uh, butadiene, styrene kind of things, 
nylon, and so on. So those are a little bit harder to, to process, and they take a lot longer to degrade in nature. Okay, so you're thinking, okay, well, this is interesting. I know the history and so on, so we have this whole plethora of polymers and so on. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that uh, these waste plastics have actually caused a huge environmental uh, uh, issue. And some of the images that you see on the screen there are related to exactly that. What was happening is that we were, we were actually developing faster than we were actually uh, able to get rid of the waste materials that were being produced. Part of the problem is a huge portion of the plastics that we produce are related to wrapping things up or just, and it's single use. Once it's used for, the, for its purpose, it's thrown away. What happens with that? So the, the very first problem that we could see from an environmental, environmental perspective is that when it comes to uh, plastics, there are two main issues associated with this section, and that is that we're using fossil fuels, which means we're burning fossil fuels, which means we're producing carbon dioxide and other gases, and we're using a non-renewable energy source, and we already are in an energy crisis. So for those of you who are going to the pump, and discovering that your gas is now $2.20 per, per liter, you're going, oh, is there another way? Perhaps I need to buy a horse. <laughs> so the majority of the plastics that we have are coming from these fossil uh, fuel feedstocks. Only 2% at the moment, current figures, 2% are coming from biopolymers. According to the World Economic Forum, about somewhere between 4 and 8% of these non-renewable feedstocks gas and oil, are used to make plastics, which we just throw away. So that's contributing towards the energy crunch. But not only that, when those fossil fuels are burnt, they produce carbon dioxide and other gases, they're going out into the atmosphere. And if you have a look there, you'll see uh, in terms of uh, the annual production just associated with plastics, 1.7 gigatons. That is a huge quantity, and that was only 2015. I tried looking. Uh, there's no new figures that I could find for recent numbers, but you can tell it's larger than that now. Well, carbon dioxide, together with these other gases, are known to be in greenhouse gases, so not only are we using a fossil fuel for a purpose that we just throw away afterwards, so we're wasting energy, we're also producing a byproduct that actually is trapping in heat into the earth, which is causing climate change. This is a scary statistic. In 2020, uh, some studies were done to find out uh, these single-use uh, single plastics, wrappings, and so on. Who's making them? Um, about 40% of the plastics that we know associated with that, it turned out that about 80% of all these waste plastics were coming from about four or five main companies. That, that's scary. And worse than that, they weren't burning it in their own backyard when they were getting rid of it. So we're going to developing countries and burning it there. All right, so that's, a, that's an issue, and you can see the burning waste on the right-hand side of the screen there. What's the second one? Well, the second one is plastic pollution in the soil. And it's not something we typically tend to talk about, but it's important. If you have a look uh, at the statistics, somewhere between 6 and 9 billion tons of plastic have been thrown away since it was produced in the, in the 1940s. Of those, only 5 billion has found its way either to landfill or has seeped its way out into the rest of the environment. What are the problems associated with that? Well, I've, in, uh, I've said it before, some of those plastics take forever to degrade. Uh, in some cases, there are predictions of up to 1,000 years for plastics, and that's usually the class 7 plastics there to actually degrade. And part of the, re the reason for that is that microbes don't know how to break those things down. They are not naturally programmed to do that. So they don't know how to do it. So it just sits in the soil. Peat, for example, that's the drinking bottles that we use for water. 450 years is what's the predicted lifespan in, in the environment. Not only that, but we now have the problem of what happens when the bottle actually breaks down or the plastic breaks down. So typically what we're finding is that if it is in the sunlight, for example, in a landfill, it starts to react with light and then it starts to break down. We call that degradable. Yay, it's degraded. But it doesn't degrade back down to its original starting point. It just degrades down to smaller particles of plastic. And those smaller particles of plastic actually find themselves getting into the environment. A study in 2020 indicated that um, when you have microplastics in soil, they 
a decrease in the number of species that are associated with the fertility of the soil. So we're actually polluting the soil and the organisms that are in there and allowing the soil to be fertile enough to be able to be used for further purposes. The other thing about microplastics is that when microplastics are in the ground, they can also be uptaken by uh, plants. But typically, um, if they get degraded even further, and that's probably the next step that we're going to have, the next problem we're going to have, is that not only do we have microplastics, but if microplastics break down even further, they become nanoplastics. Nanoplastics are about a thousand of the size of micro. They are able to cross the blood-brain barrier. They are able to cross over into the placenta. And so this now means that vertebrates and mammals and so on, they're, they're able to have these things ingested and taken into the cell. Uh, it changes things like gene expression uh, and can, uh, can do all sorts of other things inside the body. So I think this is going to be one of the next problems that we're going to start seeing. And we're going to be talking about not about microplastics, but what nanoplastics can do, because they're even worse than microplastics. And the last is that once these plastics actually degrade, so yeah, they're degrading, they actually can produce byproducts that are extremely toxic to humans uh, and uh, to other species as well. And you can see carcinogens, immune disorders, and so on. Uh, a, a student of mine in South Africa looked at immune, uh, at uh, endo, endocrine disrupting, disrupting all, uh, chemicals. So these uh, disrupt your hormone regulation. The last one is the one we are most familiar with, and that's, that's the idea of microplastics in the sea. And that's very disturbing. Um, you see that these plastics that were in the landfill have now migrated uh, as microplastics into other parts of the, uh, of the water system. Uh, they could be, uh, it's illegal dumping, uh, whether that's a company or individuals that are doing that. Approximately 14 million tons of plastic each year enter into the sea. These are scary statistics. So we go like, oh, the numbers are horrible, right? Uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which really is a huge area where that's what we can see. We don't even know what's going on below that because most of that's the plastic that's not, that's not sinking. Where the rest of the plastics go, they go down to the lower levels. Uh, what's the problem with that? Well, uh, there's entanglement. So species get entangled in that. They take it in. They ingest it. Uh, they think they're full. They're not. They starve. Um, and so, or they suffocate. So this is a terrible problem. So these definitely pose a huge risk. So these three areas are, are huge problems for us. So what has been done? What's the remediation uh, solution to this? Well, we've come up with some really good ideas. Let's, let's use some, some alternatives. Uh, collagen, chitin, cellulose, alginate, DNA, and so on. And a lot of good work has been done. This, this is where the hope comes in. We are moving away, as I said, that 2% of the bioponymous. We're moving away from using fossil fuels. So you, we're thinking about this more strategically. How can we do this? We are recycling more than we used to, so that's, that's good. Um, although we have to look very carefully at what we mean by recycling. There are companies that actually take plastic and burn it and say they're making green energy. They're not. That's not part of recycling. And we're also changing the way we think about how we use resources. At the moment, we use a very linear economy. We, you know, we, we get the resource, we process the resource, we make something, and we go, ah, don't want it, we chuck it away. And then maybe somebody comes and gets it and we try and recycle it, maybe. Um, the circular economy takes into account that at every step in the design process, you have to say, okay, how can I, where is this going to go? What happens to this when it's finished? And so on and so on. Um, so this is a, a good, a really good development and an area of hope. The problem is when it comes to recycling, and it's a shocking statistic, we think we're doing our bit by putting stuff in the bins that say recyclable, only 9% of what we throw away actually gets recycled. And of that 9%, it gets recycled once to something lower than it was before, and then gets burned or put into, put into landfill. So we have a large area of, of possibilities here as far as Canada is concerned. And if you think that's bad, North America is about the same value. So America is doing pretty much the same. So what else are we doing? Well, some of the latest research, we're looking at some of the byproducts, things that we would typically have thrown away because you're using single plastic as wrappings and stuff like that. So there's some fish products and so on that they're using. Uh, new developments in enzymes, using enzymes, using microbes, uh, genetically modifying microbes. But that's also scary because once they get out, what, when did they stop eating stuff? All right, so that's another, another issue altogether. Uh, this is a, a new area, depolymerizing polymers. 
actually getting catalysts to take a, a, a polymer and take it back to its original starting point with the recent research. And then, of course, we're looking at bioplastics. And again, we have to be careful about what we mean by bioplastics. They say, well, this is biodegradable, which means uh, it will break down into microplastics. But the organisms will do it. Or it's compostable, but it means you need a proper composting uh, instrument to do that, which high temperature and so on, you can't do that in your backyard. So we still have to think about these things a bit. So th this is the backdrop to why we're doing the research we're doing. And so we've divided, we divided our research into four main areas. The, the last of that is a relatively new development. The first of these is the synthesis of functional, safer, uh, and softer templates. These are templates that can be removed. So what is a template? Well, it's, it's some structure that can be molded or shaped that could be used to uh, develop another material that will move around it or wrap around it. Uh, so because that material doesn't necessarily form that shape. And so we can use these templates for that purpose. And templates could be hard, difficult to remove them and so on, but they, they retain their structure, they're firmly stable, they're chemically stable and so on. Or they can be softer, they're more flexible and easier to remove. In previous research, what we did is we took calcium carbonate. So uh, you take calcium ions, carbonate ions, you precipitate them. It's a straightforward precipitation reaction. You use a directing agent. Usually it's a surfactant of some kind, some kind of soap. And it directs the structure. As you see over there, these nice little spheres. And once you have that, you can uh, carbonize them, put them in the presence of the carbon vapor, and they form these wonderful sphere-like structures. They are two microns, so they are bigger than the nano. Um, but this is one of those where uh, we've actually removed the template. We were thinking, well, it's kind of, kind of wasteful. You know, you, you make a template to cover it with carbon, and then you get rid of the template. What if the template could be something that's useful? And the carbon, something that's useful. And so we've moved towards uh, looking at uh, copper uh, templates. And this is copper uh, carbonate. And uh, we've already done this in the laboratory, so we're still early stages with this. We've made the, uh, the copper carbonate. We've characterized it relative to a reference, uh, so we know that we're making what we think we're making. Um, and we're getting particles that are less than a micron in size. These are clumps. Of course, this is optical microscopy. So uh, our next step here would be to send these samples to South Africa, where we'll be using electron microscopes to actually look at the samples, see what their actual sizes are. Uh, and uh, get a sense of what we've made. The next step is to actually make these carbon structures that we want to use um, because we want to put them into other plastic materials to make composites for, for functional reasons. Well, what is a template? Well, I said to you it's a shape material. In our case, the uh, copper carbonate are known to form either micro or nanosphere. So you take uh, the template, and you pass a carbon gas over that. What we found before in previous research in the laboratory is that you can use waste plastics as the carbon vapor. We use polystyrene. Uh, this is an NSERC uh, funded project that we did. And when we did that, we were able to coat the template with, uh, with carbon. In that case, it was a calcium carbonate, but we're uh, going to do the same thing now with uh, the uh, copper carbonate. After that, you could decide whether you want to remove the, the template or not, uh, in which case you'd be left with hollow spheres, hollow carbon spheres, micro or nano. We're still at the stage where we're, we're developing this. Or alternatively, by using heat treatment, you change the internal template to something else. In this case, we are aware that when you heat treat, uh, the copper carbonate, it actually forms either copper one oxide or copper two oxide. And there is a fundamental reason for that, and I'll explain that to you just now. So our next step would be to carbonize. We were going to do this with, this week, um, but it's been a, a pretty hectic week, so we'll probably start with that next week. So we're still in the early stages of doing this. The way we do that is we have a two-stage furnace. The first stage is we put our plastic waste inside there, so we cut it out into smaller pieces or grind it down into powder. It goes into there. Our templates, the things that we're interested in, go into here. We heat up the vapor from the waste plastic. That vapor comes and it goes over these templates and it coats the template with the carbon. 
The next stage is to make uh, these, these uh, thin foam uh, materials, and the reason for that is we want to make uh, we want to make some device that will allow um, metal pipes to stop corroding. In order to do that, we want to make a, a, a plastic pipe that goes inside the metal pipe because the plastic will stop that process. We want to just do that. Um, we want to make that more functional than it currently is. So in order to test this idea, we've actually started making thin films, which then could eventually be wrapped up into a tube that would be able to go into there. To do this, we refurbished the, uh, refurbished the platen that we had at uh, Trinity. Um, and Nate, I see, is in the audience here, and Nate is part of that process of getting it done. It was rusty and so on, and it hadn't been used for many years. The idea is this is like a stack bridge maker or a, a griddle. They are flat plates. They are high temperature and high pressure. So you put your plastic waste in there and squish them out. That was our very first attempt at making a thin film. Right? Our next step would be to mix the carbonaceous stuff that we've just made into this and make a make a composite, and then to send all of that information through to uh, Dr. Mutu at the University of Regina. So send him also some of these materials. He has a different way of what he wants to do. It's called electric spinning. I can chat about that later on for those who are interested uh, in that. And the last stage is now, assuming that we've now made these materials, to test them. One of the problems that we're trying to address is the corrosion of these water pipes, whether it's sewage or co containing uh, drinking water. And you can see in the image on the left-hand side there, there's the pitting, there's pitting and so on, and even um, the breaking of the pipe itself. This is an oxidation reduction process where iron becomes iron 2, it dissolves, it comes out of the thing, leaves the pipe. Uh, subjected to uh, fatigue and can actually break, in which case you have a problem. What we discovered though is that um, along with the normal oxidation reduction process of this corrosion, is biofilm buildup inside the pipe. And when the biofilm, when biofilm gets formed, the biofilm starts to be corrosive towards the pipe and actually can do exactly the same process as before. And so our next step now in this latest project is, um, is to try and see, can we make a pipe that will go into that metal pipe that will stop biofilm buildup and stop corrosion? Literature indicates that copper, copper one, copper two, or copper by itself is very good at destroying biofilm. And this is where uh, Dr. Nyango's work is going to come in. And so what we aim to do is to make these materials as thin films and then to test them out and see if it does in fact stop co uh, the corrosion and stop biofilm buildup inside um, the pipe. To do this, we've, uh, with the help of Dr. Mutu, designed uh, a uh, very simple system to try and figure out, hey, can we find out if this thing works? The way that we do that is to make our thin foam, put it uh, in, uh, at the bottom over here with metal underneath. There's our metal um, disc that we would have, very simple, relatively cheap, we can make multiple of these, we tried it out in the laboratory, the principle works, and so now we know that we can actually test out some films, and we're, that's our very next step in doing it. And you can see there, there was the very first thin film that we made, we cut it into a circle there, put it inside there, and we tested to see whether it's actually watertight or not. The water would sit on top here, um, and then we'd leave it for periods of, of days, weeks, um, and test to see what happens to the metal underneath, does it get does it corrode, doesn't it corrode, and so on. But our next steps would be to make many of these. We have purchased everything we need to make lots and lots of these. Um, so we can do re these tests again and again. Um, so we want to run uh, duplicates of these. But this is the exciting part, and this is the part where one of our other researchers is starting to do this kind of work. We're looking at the literature at the moment. How do we put some of these thin film materials into the presence of biofilm producing bacteria? and seeing how they do. That, that is going to require a specific, I think it's class two laboratory, so we have to be careful with organisms and so on, but we're going to be testing that out, and so we're in the very early stages of that. I think just in summary then, um, this project only looks at a very, very small subset of plastics. And we're looking at you know polypropylene, poly, uh, uh, polyethylene and so on, polystyrene films. We're using polystyrene to make the carbonaceous materials, but we're doing this in a very, it's very, very small scale. So the intention is, in partnering with, uh, like for example, Tim and, and uh, at the University of Regina, to 
not only use small quantum interfaces like we're doing now, but to go to the next step and saying, how do we make a big dent in that mound of plastic? In terms of acknowledgments, I just want to thank the uh, people in the group who are busy helping us out with this research. And you can see them over there, and some of them are in the audience here today. I'd like to thank Yeshua Hamashir, uh, John Templeton Foundation, the MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust, and Trinity for allowing this research to be done. And finally, I want to thank you for your time and your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Durbach. Um, we promised you particles of hope, and certainly you dragged us through um, great depths of despair at the first. It really is um, amazing hearing how terrible plastic is. When you pick up a piece of plastic, you think of it as an innocent kind of thing, but it's wonderful that um, we're learning new ways to deal with it. And I realized before I introduce our next speaker that I forgot to introduce myself. I'm David Clements. I'm Assistant Dean of the Faculty in Natural Applied Sciences, and I work with the Dean, who um, you met earlier. And uh, the, the, there's been some great joys of this. It's actually a new position at Trinity, this Assistant Dean of Science. And one of the great joys was really applying for this grant and coordinating it and allowing you know, scientists like Dr. Durbach to be set free to do this research because um, the research is well supported by this grant. And the uh, other researcher he mentioned, Dr. Nyango, is actually our, our second fellow in the series. So there'll be three fellows over three years. So Dr. Durbach is fellow number one. And uh, so when we were um, meeting to uh, plan this event um, with uh, Tim Stevenson, who is a high school teacher at Walnut Grove, high school, um, that gave us a lot of hope, I think. I think Shane would agree, um, because uh, when we were meeting, um, Mr. Stevenson was in his high school environment, and he kept getting interrupted by students, <laughs> and that's what students are good at, and it was so neat to see, because they were in the middle of doing some of the plastic um, recycling experiments that... Um, Tim is going to talk about. So, as I mentioned, Tim is a high school teacher. He teaches chemistry and astronomy, and he did his BSc at a place called Trinity Western University in uh, finishing 1987, then went on to do his education degree at Simon Fraser University. And he also went on to do a master's at University of Portland, um, specializing in education leadership and administration, and He's an administrator as well as getting to dabble with um, plastic in the lab. Uh, and I highly recommend uh, watching his TEDx talk from 2017. Kind of tell us some of the story of his life, how he got interested in astronomy, and how he, there he actually calls climate change the next big space race, just like um, we had the space race to get to the moon. Um, our race against time is, is now on for climate change. So it's really exciting to, uh, to hear his passion for that. He also does a podcast, so you can find him all over the place. And uh, I highly recommend the podcast on invasive species, definitely, when you can't miss. <laughs> all right, so uh, welcome, Tim. All right, well, thank you very much. Dave, appreciate that. Appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak to you guys. Um, I have a different focus, perhaps, from Dr. Durbach, PhD. I appreciate all the research. I mean, it really is beautiful thing. But we come from a, a different uh, point of view at the high school, but, but a similar point of view. And in a high school setting, we tend to work from uh, kind of a blend between the academics, but also the passionate side. We're trying to we're trying to rev these kids up. We're trying to get them excited about what they can do next. And uh, high school, probably education across the board, has a notorious reputation for being a little bit dry and a little bit uh, curricular. And uh, we need to break that mold a little bit. And people uh, have to come along and say, you know what, uh, there's far more to um, chemistry, for example, than balancing chemical reactions, right? There's some phenomenal chemistry that's going on in, in, in 
in terms of the plastic, for example, and that's what we're focusing on. And I wanted to sort of start with this point right here, uh, uh, my first slide. My slides will be very different from Dr. Durbeck's, um, um, but I'll explain, and you'll understand as we go along here. Uh, with knowing comes caring. Uh, I, I, did, I did, in fact, use that theme in my TED Talk, that the, the moon race today, the great moonshot today is, is, is the climate. It's not just trying to beat some other nation to the moon. Now we're trying to save the entire planet. And there's some truth to that. And I want to draw that out a little bit. I, I love this image. And I want you to know a little bit about this picture. Because this picture, uh, believe it or not, I think changed the world. Uh, this picture was taken in uh, 1968 on Christmas Eve. Uh, Apollo 8 was the crew. Uh, Bill Anders, Frank Borman, and Jim Lovell uh, on board, and uh, they were sent to uh, the moon, not to land there though, they were sent there to uh, orbit. They were going to test the Apollo missions uh, in every which way except the landing part. Uh, this was actually scheduled to go later in 1969, but they had caught word that the Russians were just a little bit ahead of them in some uh, uh, one of their missions, so, so they thought, well, we, we better get going, so they, they rushed it, they got a, ahead of schedule, and it was actually Christmas Eve, 1968, when they actually arrived at the moon and orbited, and as they came up around the corner of the moon, if you will, there was the Earth rise. Now, you've all seen a sunrise, and you've probably seen a moon rise, but none of you have seen an Earth rise. This is very significant, because this is the very first picture ever taken of the planet in its entirety. Okay, we had orbited Earth, going way back to, you know, John Glenn, he was the first person to orbit the Earth. But we had never, we had never seen the whole Earth. And there it was, just sort of hanging in all of its glory in, in, in the blackness of the cosmos. And we realized at that moment, that's home. That's where we live. We have no planet B. And if we don't take care of this one, we, we don't have any alternative. So as a result, you know, the common expression is we, we went to space to discover, you know, more about the moon, but really what we did was we discovered Earth. And this is an enormously significant moment. And so this picture was taken, it was called Earthrise, appropriately, and it was splashed all over magazines and newspapers. Within five years, the Environmental Protection Act was in, enacted. The Clean Waters Act was enacted. Uh, environmental groups sprung up. The whole idea of, we, uh, of the environmental movement was, was, was born after people looked at this picture and said, oh my God, that's us. And there's no color-coded country. There's no dotted lines indicating different political regimes. There's just a big blue and white ball that contains every living person who's ever walked on the face of this planet. They've all lived right there. Yeah. And actually, uh, it's sort of a, an interesting side note. When um, Apollo 11 went uh, later in 1969, so about six or seven months after this picture was taken, um, uh, the three people were Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and, uh, and uh, Mike Collins. Mike Collins was pegged as the... Um, as the command module pilot. And so while Buzz and Neil went down to the moon, uh, Mike Collins uh, orbited the moon while they were down on the surface of the moon. And there was a moment he said uh, he was the, the loneliest man in the universe because he said to himself as he came around the sort of the backside of the moon, he said, well, well, there's Neil and Buzz down there. And there's the four billion people that live on Earth over there. And out this way, there's nobody. Is me. He said it was one of the most incredible moments of his life. But this is the beautiful thing about space, and, and the combination between the space and the environment is, 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 I've made a career out of this. Like, you have to understand that when you're in university, you, you have to find these things. What is that thing that you're going to be for you? And for me, it became space. And then and it kind of evolved into the environment and climate and, and this sort of, this education that is, um, without a doubt, the, the single most important science that we can teach our young people today is to understand that the, the continuous uh, you know, perpetuation of humanity on this planet depends on how we treat it. And we're compelled to take care of our planet when we see pictures like this. 
So I just love this kind of thing. Um, and I, I hope you do too. <laughs> and I hope you come to love this sort of thing. It's a spectacular moment. Um, there was, uh, there was a, a time about five years ago. <laughs> a couple of boys walked into my classroom and they said, Mr. Stevenson, we want to start an engineering club. And I said, well, why don't you go talk to the physics teacher? <laughs> what do I know about engineering? And they said, well, we, we want to talk to you because we think you have a lot of good ideas. And I said, well, you got me there. I do. And so what do you want to do? And so these two boys said, we don't know. Let's brainstorm. Let's, and so we sat down for a while. It wasn't long before I said to them, if you're going to do something valuable with your time in an engineering club, you're going to do something with the plastic pollution problem. And somehow or other take what is otherwise free, it's a free resource, blowing down the streets in our ditches. People just throw it indiscriminately, thinking mindlessly about it. But it's a free resource now. What can we do with that? And if we don't do something with it, it just stays in the environment. You know, these things that we use for five or ten minutes, five or ten minute lifespan in our hands, but a thousand years in the environment. It's just ludicrous that this sort of thing goes on. So what can we do with this? So, uh, so here's, here's William Zhang. William is now a, a legend. William is in his third or fourth year at uh, the University of uh, UBCO, actually, in Kelowna. And he's doing a mechanical engineering degree. At this time, he was in grade 12. And, uh, and, I, and we said, here's what we can do. Let's take plastic bags. And we held a contest. For every bag of bags that you bring in to my classroom, we'll put your name in a draw. And we got all kinds of prizes donated. We, we, we contacted organizations all over the place. And we said, we're doing this. And they kept sending me t-shirts and sweatshirts and sunglasses and things I can just give away as, uh, as awards for this prize. And we had a mountain of plastic in my classroom. Thousands, literally thousands of plastic bags were in my classroom. And uh, it kind of got a little smelly, but, uh, you know, it was uh, sort of the fun part of it. And so, uh, what are we going to do with these things? Well, uh, we came up with this idea that you could melt it in, in uh, cooking oil. So we had a big vat of cooking oil, and we, uh, we melted these things. And it's not too dissimilar from, um, uh, often my wife, Cheryl, will, will be cooking for me, and, and I'll see the amount of vegetables she's putting in the frying pan. Now, what are you doing? <laughs> now watch, it gets, you know how it does that? What is that leafy vegetable that just shrinks down? Spinach will do that. Plastic, uh, now this is, um, this is LDPE, this is class 2, low density polyethylene, and it just shrinks down, and William would be at the, in my fume hood, and he'd be putting 10 and 12 bags in, i go, well, William, I don't think that's all going to melt, and he, it would just go, ding, 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 ding. and then he put another 10 or 12, ding, 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 ding. and then he had this big slough of melted plastic in this vat of oil, and, um, and we, we, he, he would swap it out and drop it out. He'd been down to the wood shop, and so we incorporated the wood shop teacher, and they built, a, and I still got it. It's a beautiful structure. It's a, it's a, it's a hand press. It's a, using a lever, and it, it, it just works beautifully. And, and we slop it in here, and we just press it down, and, and uh, of course, a cube is, not, well, like a, like a right angle cube is an, an, it's an easy shape to mold. And we press it, and after about a minute or so, it would, it would be solid. And then we, so, push it out and put it into the sink and it would cool off. And we had a bit of a problem with, um, with, uh, uh, it was, it, they're sticky and there was a bit of a smell to them. And we, we ran them through a lot of wash cycles. But each one of those bricks has, uh, about, um, 35 to 40 bags per brick. And there's 40 bricks here. So there's over 1500 bags that are permanently locked into this. Now you see, this is, this is sort of an idea that we've always had is we, we want to turn these otherwise single-use plastics into a carbon sink, right? So a place where it's contained permanently. We don't want to make these, as, uh, as Dr. Gerbach pointed out, these plastics that are recycled into something that's a lower form and ends up in the garbage anyway. So this um, garden planter is what it became. We filled it with dirt. We planted flowers. And it's still in my classroom. Come visit me. And you can see it. I've got these beautiful vines growing out of it. And it's this, this beautiful um, indication of, 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 a, of a sort of this chronic plague in our planet that's turned into this place with these beautiful flowers and things growing. And it's symbolic, right? It's a symbolic gesture. Most of what we do is very symbolic. To say that, to say that you know, this is something that can happen. You know, I'm doing it in this small scale. What are you going to do? Can you do it in a bigger scale? Can you magnify what I'm doing? So it's a symbolic gesture for what can happen. And, um, and so we're very, very happy with that little, 
little planter. And ever since then, uh, you know, William has become a legend. I was just con- uh, connecting with him on uh, Instagram recently, and he was back in, in Langley, uh, at a, and he was at a restaurant. So we, we Instagram talked for a while. And then this is the neat thing about it, because he's still passionate about this thing. And, and I tell him, and I, said, and I said to my students recently this week, what are you going to do in your time at school? And you can sit, think the same way in your, your time at Trinity Western University. What are you going to be doing? What do you do now that, that they're going to be talking about five years from now? Because we're still talking about William. And he graduated four years ago. What are you doing that they're still going to be talking about? Remember the student was here? That was a, a brilliant strategy. That was a brilliant project that this student started. And now look where it's become. And so you should always be thinking to yourself, don't, don't think about what you're going to get out of university. Think about what you're going to do and offer. Don't think about your marks. Marks are nothing. Marks mean nothing. What are you going to do with your time at, at university? What are you going to do with your time in high school? And, and William is, is a living legend. Now, I want to point out a couple of things. Okay, uh, You mentioned the, the podcast, and it's called Science 360. Uh, um, I, I've been very deliberate in my attempt to learn and, and become more aware myself. Uh, one of my, one of my philosophies as a teacher is, if I can't, if I can't profess to my students who I'm learning from, then really all I'm doing is, is teaching my students what I learned at Trinity Western University between 84 and 87. Well, I think things have changed since then, right? (laughs) If I haven't learned anything since I graduated in 1987 from this school, this building wasn't here in those days, if I've learned nothing since then, what right do I have as being a teacher in a high school today? I have to be learning all the time, and if I'm not, then then shame on me. And so I, I seek out deliberately teachers that I can learn from. Anything that I teach, I've learned from somebody. Well, Craig Leeson is one of them. If you haven't heard of Craig Leeson before, this is the person you should look up. Uh, he he okay, kind of came on the scene on a sort of a more global scale when uh, he became the, he was the director of a film called A Plastic Ocean. It's on Netflix. You should watch it. And uh, it's, it talks about his discovery of the ocean, of the plastic that was floating in the ocean, and, um, and what he attempted to, to expose the issue. And he doesn't really do anything about it in the film other than raise awareness. But the film's been broadcast around the globe. It's been translated into multiple languages. And because of, uh, of the film, what did I do? And did you ever think about doing this yourself? I reached out to him. And, and for the last two or three years, I mean, I'm not saying that we're, we're, okay, we would be friends if we were face to face. I've never met him face to face. But we communicate on Instagram and Twitter kind of fairly often. <laughs> You know, how come? This guy's an international filmmaker. I just teach high school in Langley, British Columbia. Right? So he's got a much higher profile than I do, and yet he's very willing and he wants to reach out and talk and just continue the discussion. So I learned from his experience. And so I had him on my, on my podcast and we, we talked about this, this comment that with knowing comes caring. And, um, and with, and then of course with caring come, comes action. You won't act on anything you don't know about. You gotta care about it, then you'll act on it. And so I, I wanted to just sort of make this as part of my presentation this morning, is that part of what you have to do is you have to reach out. You can't wait for it to come to you. And um, in this case, uh, this is I think this is a, this is a great example. I would encourage you to listen to it. He creates a very insightful character. Um, he's just about to release uh, this month uh, his most uh, recent uh, pro- uh, project called The Last Glacier. So if you're, if you're truly interested in climate issues, you're not just interested in plastic. You're also interested in the fact that uh, fossil fuels have run their course. This has been a 170-year experiment where we've been uh, burning fuels. And at the beginning, I always tell my students, when I watched Mary Poppins, I watched, um, is it Bert? Who, who's the, the chimney sweeper guy? Bert. And I think right there. Starting right there, they don't even know it. Why is why do we have chimney sweepers and lamp lighters? Because they burned everything. They didn't know it was just convenient. I have light, I have heat, I can cook my food, I can actually transport myself if I turn it into steam. This is brilliant stuff, and it doesn't matter because the the smoke 
Or it'll just blow away. It'll just blow away. Okay, but wait, wait, we saw that picture of Earthrise. Tell me something. Where is away? There's no away. Right? I remember back in, in, in the 70s, um, they'd have a, a factory and uh, they'd have a smokestack. And um, the neighbors would be complaining, hey, the smokestack's blowing smoke into our backyard. I don't like it. Oh, well, okay. No, I understand. We'll just build a bigger smokestack. And that way it'll blow away farther. It really just goes to the next town, right? So we didn't think the right way. In those days, we just thought of convenience. And now all of a sudden we're waking up and we're going, wait a minute, this is, this is something that we have to be concerned about. So now as we burn these fuels, of course, this resulted in this um, uh, extra CO2. Uh, what are we up to now? 420 parts per million? And it, was, it started out um, under 300 uh, back in the industrial era. And, um, and as, that, uh, as that blanket holds the air, the air gets warmer. As the air gets warmer, it gets into the ocean. Of course, the ocean has a higher heat capacity. That heat capacity keeps that ocean warmer. And with the warmer ocean, we have more evaporation. We have thermal expansion. Therefore, we have ocean levels rising. And of course, if we got uh, warmer water, we're ultimately going to have melting glaciers. And if we have warmer air, we'll have mel uh, melting alpine glaciers. And so Craig Leeson has, has made this incredible film. It's, it's, it's in IMAX. It's just being released this. In fact, I think this last night in Sacramento, uh, he had his uh, sort of the premiere viewing of this documentary. So you should definitely try to check out uh, once you once you hear about it, but or once you once you see it kind of coming around. Uh, but I, my my point with this slide is just to say to you, who are you reaching out to, and who are you learning from? Um, are you are you are you learning from the people who are who are placed in front of you because you pay tuition, which is good. I'm not taking away from that. It's good. But but who are you also reaching out to? Who are you connecting with globally? Because on a global scale, people are doing this. Uh, you think of Boy and Slat, who started up the ocean uh, the ocean cleanup. They're out in the uh, Great Pacific Gyre, and they're skimming the, the plastic off the ocean. And, and of course, I've never connected with him. I have connected with his assistant, though. I've tried to get him onto my podcast, and they said yes. <laughs> but that hasn't happened yet. Okay, <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> you know, you said yes, but whatever. Um, uh, others around the world uh, that are doing uh, great things with uh, plastic and climate issues. And the beautiful thing about it is, is, it, is it's not my generation, right? It's your generation who are coming along and saying, enough. Okay, we've watched you guys getting rich off of the, um, you know, the, the proceeds of the planet. And we've seen what it's done to the planet that we've inherited from you. Enough. Now, you guys get out of the way and let us do what we know is good for this planet. And it's going to take time and it's not going to be easy because money breeds money and these people are rich and they don't want to back off. And I understand that, of course. I get it. But the fact of the matter is, um, um, there, there's a lot of people doing stuff, and um, people like Craig Leeson has a big stage on, in which to, to do so, and I, and I really appreciate his work. Um, moving on to, so what are we doing at, <laughs> in our scale? So um, I have been associated with Plastic Oceans Canada. Uh, they um, they helped me procure a $10,000 grant, and we built this. <laughs> This is a uh, plastic shredder. It's based off the uh, plans that you would find on the website Precious Plastics. If you ever go to Precious Plastics, uh, this is a guy in, the, in, in Europe, I believe Denmark. He's set up an entire website on how to build these machines to turn your plastic uh, pieces into something new. You can become your own recycler, right? Micro-recycling. Every uh, member, member Bill Gates at one time said um, his goal is that everybody in the world will have a computer on their desktop. Well, it happened, right? Maybe the goal should be everybody in the world should have their own plastic recycling uh, processor in, the, in their garage. It could be a micro business. Uh, who knows what it could be? Um, not, to, not to dismiss the fact, though, and I'll point this out. We don't want to build these things to, um, to enable more plastic, right? The, the, the ultimate goal is to eliminate single-use plastic, not to build machines to make it more conveniently disposable, uh, which is really what this is. What you want to do is move towards a stage where you're, um, um, you know, like you think of the, the three R's, um, what, which are uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Um, there's a lot more R's than that. A lot more R's. The first R should be refuse. Refuse. So I drive an electric car. What do I do? I'm refusing gas. Are the gas prices $2.20? Oh, that's what I didn't know. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me. 
you know? I don't care. I refuse gas, right? Um, what, uh, what, what are the other R's? What about repurpose? What about repair? Um, so the idea of, 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 of recycle, in fact, recycle should be the very last R. The very last R. It shouldn't be the first R. It should be the last one. So if I have a, an item, um, I'm going to repair it, or I'm going to I'm going to uh, repurpose it. Uh, I mentioned that plastic brick planter hanging above it. We built this structure, and we're using uh, two-liter pop bottles as uh, as hanging baskets. So I have all these vines hanging out of these plastic two-liter bottles, and um, um, and it works great. Uh, it's, I, I've, I've got hung above it a, a lamp that has uh, you know photosynthesis specific spectrum of light. And um, and these plants just grow, and it's this beautiful symbolic gesture of <laughs> life growing out of plastic. And so anyway, but this machine does serve a purpose, though, because in the meantime, we are shredding plastic. Now, as an example, um, uh, you see sitting on top of that one right there, there's a little plastic tray. There's an, or, uh, there's an organization that packages food just across the river in Pitt Meadows. And um, uh, during the uh, atmospheric rivers, uh, sorry, you know, the Atmosphere River back in November. Uh, you know, don't forget, in, in, in three days, we had 500 millimeters of rain, right? The average in November is, is 300. So in three days, we almost doubled our monthly total. And, um, and, and we wanted to say, well, it's just... Um, it's just the sun's going through a phase, right? It's just a cycle. I'm sure it will pass. It's nothing really climate. It's rained before. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, what happened was during that uh, storm, uh, this outfit in Pitt Meadows who packages food had 50 boxes. Um, 50, in fact, the box is, is right here behind. Um, there's 50 boxes that were flooded, and because they're used to package foods, they're uh, now not usable. And the guy is like, oh, I, I, I can't use them. There's nothing I can do. And there's literally, um, there's probably a thousand of those things per box. He's got 50 boxes. They're all garbage. He goes, I'm throwing them in, in the landfill. And then, and then through a Facebook group that one of my students was, in, was connected with, in fact, I think one of my students' mothers was connected with, heard about these and contacted them, and they said, well, we'll send you all 50 boxes. Really, the last thing he wants to do, I don't, he goes, I don't want to put these in the landfill. Will you take them all? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I mean, where am I going to put them? 50 boxes. So I took two. I took two boxes of these things, and we've been shredding them and shredding. You can see it's all over the floor here. And uh, what, so... Uh, this is all class one. This is polyethylene terephthalate. Um, it's a, it's a remoldable plastic, but we, what we have found is this plastic, uh, has a melting point of around 285 degrees Celsius. And that's very difficult to achieve in a, in a, in a lab. Even a Bunsen burner, it, it, it doesn't respond really that well to the melting process. And so what we're thinking now is, um, why do we automatically go to heat and mold, right? Heat, melt, mold. Why not leave it as is? Are there other things we can do with it in the shredded state? So, for instance, can it be used as an insulator? So we've actually built, um, um, and well, in fact, um, in, I have two students here who are from my school, Matthew and Cannon in the back row. Cannon actually took the uh, uh, some uh, materials that we had in the school, and she built two um, houses, houses, if you will. Um, they're identical structures with a space in the walls, and we're going to stuff this plastic in the walls, and we're going to conduct some thermal experiments to see if it insulates well or not. We want to just know what the insulation properties are. Another student who's not here today, Andrea, she took a bunch of this plastic home in a box, and she's, um, she's using some, she's trying to find some sort of a fabric that um, she could make um, pillows out of. Now, not the pillow you necessarily sleep on in your bed, but what if you're out in the West Coast Trail and you want to take a weatherproof pillow, right? Well, stuff it with plastic. So somewhere where the, it can be a permanently located piece of um, a, a material. Because I'm not naive. I'm not walking around like I'm not hugging every tree. All right? I'm not. I, I, I notice that you're all sitting on chairs that are lined with plastic. These are plastic chairs. Ban plastic. Well, all right. Well, what do you start right here. We're, we can't. No, no, no. Because these plastic chairs are great. They're a permanent piece. The carbon has been trapped and stored now in these chairs. Perfect. That's what we want. What we don't want are bottles. What we really don't want are those clamshell style containers. What we don't want is Andrea walking into my classroom when she has a bag full of McDonald's single-use plastic cups. 
saying, you know what, Mr. Stevenson, all of this stuff going into the, into the dumpster up behind McDonald's, what can we do with it? And so she brought it, and I got this great big bag of McDonald's cups. And um, the, by the way, McDonald's cups are either class one, like this stuff here, or class five, polypropylene. And uh, polypropylene, we have found, is much, much easier to work with uh, in terms of the melting process. Uh, but class one, we haven't found that uh, uh, possibility. So anyway, thanks to uh, Peter Kopik of NextGen. He was the father of one of my students. So um, remember, you're always just pulling on your contacts, right? Who do you know? Who do you know? Who do you know? And when you, when you meet these people, strike up a conversation because you just never know what kind of thing they're going to say. Uh, Peter walked into my classroom one day uh, and uh, parent-teacher, meet the teacher night is what it was, meet the teacher night. And I have in my classroom an aquaponics system. This beautiful thing where I got fish up here and the water tumbles by gravity into this level where there's plants growing. Then it tumbles down here to a drainage center and then it gets pumped back up. And it's just this continuous uh, cycle. And he says, oh, aquaponics. Aquaponics, eh? You do that? I go, yeah, it's pretty fun. We're, we're just sort of learning about it. He goes, well, I make aquaponics. For, I'm an engineer. He goes, do you want a bigger system than that one? I said, well, yeah. I'm not going to say no. So he came and made one, and he donated the materials. And I, the next thing, I got two aquaponics systems. This other one was just super skookum. And um, we're growing vegetables. And we have, uh, we, have, we have salad parties about every three months where we harvest all of our food. I should have brought pictures of it. But we're talking about plastic, you know. But it's just another example of what you can do, right? You got to draw on your on your contacts, but you got to seek your contacts out, right? You got to you got to hunt them down a little bit. So this is what this is all about, and um, it's something that we're doing in in the classroom. And then um, similarly, um, I uh, I was involved in um, there's a teacher in my school, uh, Miss Patoni, who's a French immersion teacher, and uh, she teaches a social class in French. Uh, but they always do a, a unit on climate issues. And so she always has me come and speak to her class. Bonjour. <laughs> Comment ça va? And about that point, I stopped because I can't, I, I'm not bilingual. Uh, but so she allows me to do it in English. And um, so I was giving this presentation. And uh, uh, afterwards, three, three students uh, came to me and said, you know, um, I hear you saying. I'm very concerned as well. What can we do? Good question. I, I love it when students ask me that question. All right, here's an idea. Um, I have a group of students a couple of years ago started a, pro, a project and then they dropped it and they moved on. And I have it sort of sitting in the back burner waiting for some of you guys to come along. It's a story about, um, about a, a plastic bottle <laughs> named Pete who ended up in the ocean. And this is a story that's waiting to be written. And uh, it needs to be illustrated. Why don't we do that together? And so the three girls in particular got started with this. And then we were able to track down an artist. And so the artwork was done by a girl in grade 12. I went to the art teacher. I said, who do you have who's just a brilliant artist who can illustrate a, a, a children's book? And he said, oh, I know exactly who you need. Zoe Sipka. And so Zoe came on, came on board with this, did all the illustrations. And now we've got it. And here it is. And this is a, it's a storybook. It's a children's book about um, plastic Pete who gets taken to the beach by a little boy and, uh, and, and the wind picks it up and blows it in and the little, little boy doesn't really realize what he's done and it ends up in the ocean and, and next thing you know he's in the Great Pacific Ocean Gyre and he's looking around going, where's all this plastic coming from? How'd this happen? And next, um, then as the story unfolds, uh, they start to meet other forms of plastic and then they get, there's in some sort of an ocean cleanup in the Ocean Gyre, they get brought back to land and they're recycled into something new and it's a beautiful thing and uh, however, however, uh, true to my word, it's not just a story about simply recycling because if it was simply recycling, we'd miss this whole point that we're trying to eliminate this stuff in the, in the first place. So in the back of there's all these little activities. For instance, we have four different recipes on how to make edible spoons. And so um, if you're if you're eating um, soup, maybe you want to use the um, the sort of the savory flavored spoon. If you're eating ice cream, well here here's one. Uh, uh, the savory one is parm. A Parmesan and ro rosemary pie crust, right? How about a chocolate sugar cookie spoon? And so uh, you can make spoons, right? <laughs> That's kind of be a fun thing to eat. You know, eat spoons. Um, the children's book, okay? Um, you know, we have crossword puzzles and, and word searches, but we also have an ocean plastic pledge because um, this girl, Chloe Arneson, another one of my students who's graduated now, uh, she formed a group um, kind of, all these groups are kind of under my direction, but the kids just run with it. The kids just do it, right? 
uh, they called themselves STOP, STOP the Ocean Plastic, and uh, they would go to local high, uh, elementary schools and they would um, present. By the way, um, the local elementary schools love it when young people come and teach. And the kids love it when young people teach. They like it better than when teachers teach. So um, anybody here in education, I can connect you. Uh, but um, they, they developed this thing called the, um, our, uh, the Ocean Plastic Pledge. And they said, uh, here's, what, here's what the kids are to do. And they would have them stand up. I always thought, well, should we be doing this? But they get the kids to stand up, raise their right hand, and they would read, I pledge to avoid single-use plastic, to refuse, to repair, to reuse, to reduce, and recycle if necessary. And to educate others about plastic uh, waste, I pledge to do my part, to be part of the change, to create a greener world. And then they sign it right here. And, um, and, um, and there you go. And, and this book is available on Amazon. So they've been selling some. Now, you know, it's not that, not like we're selling millions of copies or anything, but people have bought it and people have used it. And, um, and it's, it's just one more piece of the puzzle, right? Uh, it's just people getting involved in doing things. So, uh, and this is, um, this is the next thing, for instance, uh, we're, you know, this crazy looking, um, well, you'll see it in the video. I got a video to play for you in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, Matthew, he's in the video. Don't worry, Matthew. They'll love it. Um, this is a fish tank that I had in my classroom and uh, an underwater fan that blows the water. And so we thought, well, if we're going to do this research, um, why don't we set up an ocean in our classroom? And so I have a UV light that I suspended over top of the fish tank. That's salt water. So we had to do a little bit of chemical molarity calculations, a little bit of stoichiometry. And we figured out, because uh, globally the oceans are 3.5% salt, so what is that by weight? And so we had to do a little bit of uh, molarity work. And then um, uh, these plastics that are floating in it are class 1, uh, which is your um, peat, and then class 2, which is your low-density, or sorry, class uh, 1, 2, 4, and 1, 5. Uh, class, high, it's high-density polyethylene anyway. And then class 5 is polypropylene. What's very fascinating about it is this fan blows the water, so it's continually circulating. Uh, we also have a heater in the water to keep the water temperature up around close to high 20s, 27, 28 degrees. So it's quite warm, and it evaporates quickly. I keep adding water to keep the water level up, but um, which is an indication of why we're having these superstorms in atmospheric rivers. Just in my classroom, I have a high temperature, and the darn thing keeps going down. Well, where's the water going? Well, it's evaporating, <laughs> right? It's just like it is in the, in the real world. And um, as it tumbles around, peat, class one, goes straight to the bottom. And you can't see it in this image, but right down here, there's a huge mound of one type of plastic. And that's fascinating. Because you put three types of plastic in and they automatically sort. And the, and the class one sinks. So when Boeing slatted his ocean cleanup, goes out to the middle of the ocean gyre and skims the ocean, trying to pick up all the plastic. The fact of the matter is, he's going to miss all of the peat. Because it's all at the bottom. And it's all ha and, and inhabiting the, the, the who knows what kind of ecosystem at the bottom of the ocean and inhibiting who knows what type of life form is being damaged by this. One of the fascinating things that I want to do as this sort of tumbles, and this is just running continuously. I never shut it off. It just, it's going right now. Brrr, around and around, the lights on, and warm water, salt water, uh, constant agitation, trying to stimulate the ocean. Given X number of weeks, months, or whatever, when do we take a water sample out of this and run it back into the lab here at Trinity and check it for any sort of, um, uh, are there, are there particles within the water that can be from the plastic? Uh, can we do some sort of, I don't know, NMR, what would it, something? You'll know. <laughs> He'll know what to do. I don't know. And, um, but that would be an interesting experiment to find out. Does the plastic um, uh, get from the solid form into the uh, nano form in, in the water? And that's something we want to find out. We could report back on that. Um, because if someone like Sylvia Earle, Sylvia Earle is, um, you know, if you haven't seen the documentary called um, uh, Mission Blue, uh, it's on Netflix as well. You should watch it. Sylvia Earle, is this a name you're familiar with? Uh, Sylvia Earle is the uh, leader probably globally of ocean research. She's now 84 years old. She's been doing this type of thing since the 50s. And um, she, she makes a very good point when she says that uh, when the plastic goes into the ocean, it doesn't break down. It breaks up. It breaks up into many, many more pieces. And so uh, this is the danger that we're seeing is it becomes um, uh, a food almost uh, to the point where the, the, the bird, the, the marine birds in particular, 
scoop this food up thinking that it's food and they feed it to their, to their chicks on the island and they're all dying and it's a terrible thing and um, uh, it's just something that we have to be aware of and, and you know, uh, we can't individually solve this problem but we can grow more and more aware of it and then hopefully go out and do something uh, on a grander scale. Um, I, I should just point out to you though that um, there is a shift and I want to make this point, I think see what my next slide is. Okay, uh, hold on another second um, for the video. But um, um, there is a shift happening, and I think it's a good one. Because uh, when the climate movement started, when, when, after Earthrise, um, the, the, the messaging was this. You need to do better, right? Uh, make sure you start with changing all your light bulbs to LED. Um, uh, shut the TV off when you leave the room. Turn your heat down, wear a sweater. Um, walk more, ride a bike. And all of the messaging was what, what each of you have to do. And people became burdened by this. And there be, there's now become known quite clinically, uh, climate anxiety. And people are diagnosed with this because they're thinking, what can I do? I can't, I can't. You can't put the weight of the world on my shoulders. I'm just a guy. And the messaging is shifting now because we're recognizing that the messaging was wrong. The messaging is now being directed toward the, toward the, the manufacturing, the industry, who are, who are producing these plastics. Coca-Cola is now funding Boyne Slat, who's setting up these huge skimmers that are skimming up the, the rivers as they flow into the ocean. Of course Coca-Cola is doing that. They're the most guilty of them all. And they should be doing it. And then they should be doing something about changing their, their bottling habits. Or some sort of incentivizing, something they could do to, I don't know, it, it's just it's a huge problem. But I'm so glad to see the messaging change from, it's not, it's not you. Right? This world is, 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 is wrecked because of what you did. Well, no, I can't handle that. You can't do that to me. The shifting is, the, the messaging is shifting. And I think that's important that, uh, we live in a country where we can freely approach our government leaders. There are countries around the world where we, where we don't have the privilege as we do in Canada to speak to our representatives and say to them, you've got to do something. And you're seeing it start. It's starting with straws, right? You're seeing paper straws more and more often now. You're seeing now your, your Chinese food is being picked up and your sushi is being picked up in um, cardboard instead of styrofoam containers. The shift has started, and it's only started in the last few years, uh, maybe three or four years. And there's now communities, entire communities. You go to the west coast of Vancouver Island from Eculet up to Tofino, there, you won't find plastic anywhere. You find plastic, you'll be shamed, right? It's, it's good. Okay, hopefully that starts moving across the country. But, um, but it's the government leaders and it's, and it's the industries that are, that are allowed to do what they're doing that they need to be pressured by us. And we're allowed to do that in Canada. And uh, you should take full advantage of that opportunity uh, to do so. Uh, so. So anyway, one of our team members uh, put together this documentary. Uh, just, he just finished it a couple of days ago. It's spectacular. And I wanted you to see it. And uh, then you get a sense for what, what's going on in a high school. Uh, uh, styrofoam and acetone. Well, the, the truth of the matter is I didn't really start the engineering team. I was approached by two students back in this, uh, the fall of 2017, uh, William Zhang and Mike Heath, and they wanted to start an engineering team, and I agreed to do it. It's always been my philosophy to say yes whenever a student has a good idea, and I thought it was a good idea. Well, the engineering team really since those days in 2017 has been focusing their attention to plastic pollution and ways to uh, mitigate the problem. What can we do with plastic? Where can we re retrieve it from the environment, the, the community around us? And then um, what can we do with it once we've got it? Can we melt it? Can we shred it? Can we repurpose it somehow? And so we're just continuing to do uh, experiments on all of these different facets of plastic pollution. I joined the engineering team because I've always been interested in like the environment and how to like help and how to make it better, especially because you know climate change has always has been it's been getting worse over the past few years and it's, and I really you know especially after you know taking the environmental science class I, I learned how much the environment is important to us and 
how we should protect it and stuff. So that's why I joined. I wanted to pursue a career in engineering and from the previous yearbooks, I saw that I, uh, there was very few people in this club. I like clubs with very few people because you can get more active. Well, I think the biggest accomplishment was the very first year where we built this uh, plastic brick planter, which just sits over my shoulder here. And uh, that the, the, each one of those bricks is made from 35 or 40 plastic bags. There's 40 bricks, so you're looking at over 1,500 uh, plastic bags are uh, permanently encased in that, uh, in that planter. And then since then, we have been able to secure a $10,000 grant from work we did with uh, Plastic Oceans Canada. And we use that money to build a plastic shredder. And we're actively uh, shredding different classes of plastic and doing experimental work uh, on, on our shredded plastic. So, so far, we've started shredding some plastic, started melting it and seeing which type of plastic melts better. And We've also recently created like an ocean ocean gyre experiment where we put like a UV light under um, a tank filled with plastic to see how plastic, you know, behaves in the ocean. Um, the plastic shredding machine works by feeding plastic through the opening at the top and the motor just grinds it up. The best parts it's probably, compared to the other clubs, it's much, much smaller. There's only like four or five people in our club, so it's like easier to get closer to people and like interact better. So, we, and like the opportunities here are like, we're pretty free. So like, we really get to, you know, really get into it and really experiment. Whereas like other clubs around the school are way too big. So then like, you never get like specific opportunities, whereas, you know, this one we do. We actually just got some bread pans from the dollar store and used that as our mold and we attempted to uh, create styrofoam bricks. Quite interesting when polystyrene is uh, dissolved in an acetone solvent uh, in, and then allows the, allowing the acetone to evaporate, what's left behind is uh, uh, scrambled molecules of styrene and it becomes very, very hard. And so we're actually able to make uh, some, some styrofoam bricks, which are extremely hard. And so we're trying to determine what we could actually do with that. We've tried uh, a number of things from uh, melting uh, bags in hot oil, which worked quite well, uh, but it left the uh, product quite sticky and uh, quite a strong smell. We've also used uh, hot air, uh, but we've also used um, uh, a contraption that we designed, uh, we put over top of a Bunsen burner. And uh, this worked best for class five, which is polypropylene. And uh, then we also have tried a panini maker. <laughs> and we've tried to make it into a sandwich between layers of parchment paper. And that's been fairly successful, again, with class five plastic to make um, sheets of plastic. Well, um, we have in mind an idea around using the plastic uh, for different purposes. Typically, you automatically go to the idea of melting it and then remolding it. But what if you don't have to remelt it? What if the shredded plastic can be used for something like a, a fill in, um, in even blankets? What if it could be used as uh, an insulation material between the walls in a house? So we're doing some experiments with insulation to see how well it's able to pre uh, pre prevent the conductivity of heat and cold. And so we've designed some little houses that we're uh, practicing that experiment on. Um, last point I'll just make to close off is um, going back to the space race. Um, of course, the space race started in 1957 because that was the year that Sputnik was launched. And in October of that year, uh, the American people in particular looked up and saw this satellite going overhead and they thought, what, what era have we just... Um, arrived at. So that very year, uh, the education system changed. And as a result of Sputnik, uh, sciences became more important. All of a sudden, the curriculum focused more on the physics and the math and, and the chemistries and the different subjects that would kind of build up the education of our young people in order to take on the new challenge of feeding the Russians to the moon. That was the, the moon race, was actually to get to the moon. Now, what's interesting about this is in 1969, when Buzz and Neil stood, stood, stood on the moon on July 20th of 1969, the average age of ground control 
the engineers and the technicians in Houston was 28. Now, 12 years earlier was 1957. They were 16. They were in high school, and they were being taught. And I find it fascinating that the even the, the government realized that in order to achieve this technological achievement, we've got to turn to the schools. And it paid off, because in 12 years, we put a man on the moon. So what's our moonshot today? The moonshot today is plastic, it's climate change, it's all these things associated. So where do we turn? We've got to turn to the schools. We've got to turn to education. We've got to turn to the people who are learning about this stuff so that they can amass their, their skills and their talents towards a common goal. The moonshot is climate. And my hope is that you guys get the education and get motivated each other to collectively do something about it. We did it in, in 12 years. And in 12 years before Neil and Buzz landed on the moon, they didn't even have a rocket. They didn't even know how to build a rocket. They had to explain what is an orbit. We don't even know what an orbit is. And in 12 years, they went from complete nothing to that incredible achievement. So if they can do that in 12 years, they can definitely do this. And that was my challenge to you guys. So thanks for having me out here today. Great. Thanks so much, Tim. It was very uh, inspiring. I feel more hopeful now. And so we're going to take a moment to uh, put the screen up and get set up for a question and answer period. So I'm sure you have burning questions. So just be thinking of your questions, whether you're here or on Zoom. On Zoom, you can use the raise hand feature. Thank you. Um, yeah, this one's for Tim. I appreciated your talk. I just, um, yeah, I was kind of wondering, you mentioned you drive an electric car, and I think, yeah, that's cool, but obviously for a lot of people, like most of the people here are students, so I, of course, don't drive an electric um, car. So I was just wondering your thoughts on, like, say, for, in BC, we get, like, a lot of our power from hydroelectricity, because we're lucky we live near a lot of rivers, but what about, um, say, yeah, most of America, say that electricity still comes from just coal or things like that, or, yeah, what is your suggestion to, say, people who can't uh, either afford an electric car or, yeah, when people ring up, like, where that electricity? Well, I, that that comes up a lot, and um, my first comment about cost of cars is it's, it's it's not expected that a university student is going to be driving a fifty or sixty thousand dollar car, uh, although I have seen some doing it. <laughs> but um, but at the same time, I see a lot of people driving in in uh, BMWs and Lexuses, and 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 then I hear them saying, "Well, electric cars are too expensive." Uh, so I, I, I also believe that everything we've talked about today is, is part of a easily 50 year continuum. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, there's going to be a transition where, and I think what you're going to find is that, especially with electric cars, people are going to switch to electric cars not because they're tree huggers. Uh, they're going to switch because it's going to make more economic sense. Uh, electricity in BC is definitely cheaper than a liter of gas right now. But not just that, but the, the maintenance of, a, of an electric car is virtually minimal to non-existent. Um, they don't break down. Um, so, so you're, you're going to see people shifting because it will make more sense to drive an electric car eventually. Not necessarily right now, but it's happening. It is happening. And, um, as far as the energy source, this is the other thing that people always say that you've shifted the, uh, the CO2 emissions have just shifted from the car to the generator. And of course, in BC, 95% of our electricity comes from falling water, uh, which is a good thing. But what if you're living in a country or, or state or province where it comes from coal-fired uh, power plants? Yeah, uh, so there, that also is a transition. So if you watch carefully what's happening with uh, the transition to renewables, coal is on the way out. Like, for instance, I would not buy stock in a coal factory. Uh, it is on the way out. And there are coal plants being shut down around the world. Um, there is a shift towards nuclear. Nuclear is going to be coming on board even more and more. And of course, solar, wind, and, and you can't ignore the possibility of uh, tapping into geothermal. Geothermal is probably the biggest energy source on our entire planet. And that's a, an unexposed market, um, except for places like Iceland, of course, but uh, uh, limited places around the world, but it's available everywhere. So anyway, I, I get what you're saying, but it, it's going to happen over, over decades. It's not going to happen over weeks. And so we have to be patient, but the more we can push it along, I think the better. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, I got a question. Uh, 
for uh, both uh, Mark and uh, for sorry for uh, Tim and for Shane. One of the big issues uh, in dealing with any kind of recycle is separating the various types of plastics one from another. I was intrigued by this whole issue of being able to separate by density. Uh, Tim, where you had your students put them into uh, a hot water tank, or not necessarily hot, but a tank, and they could separate to some degree. How successful has that been? And is that a, is there something that could be scaled up at least uh, at your level and maybe uh, create some intriguing possibilities for separating plastics that get totally mixed up that end up going into the uh, the landfill? Well, it is very fascinating that the class one sunk very quickly. In fact, I'll come along and I'll deliberately stir the whole tank up and literally within an hour is separated completely. It's fascinating to notice. Um, so, but the other two, the class uh, one plastic and the class two plastic stay mingling up near the surface. And so by density, they don't seem to separate as easily at uh, unless we, yeah, uh, certainly not in our experiment up to this point. Um, yeah, the natural separation would be brilliant if they would just do so automatically, uh, but it seems that the densities of the plastics we've been working with are um, uh, too similar to separate on their own. Um, I, I'm not sure how else uh, we or what we're where we would go next with that. Can, I, can I make a suggestion here? I'd love it. Uh, I was I was thinking actually that maybe one possibility is, of course, with water you can get your class one out, but with the rest that remain, possibly use different solvents or mixtures of solvents that might be able to uh, uh, to approach that issue. Yeah, definitely. The only solvent we're using right now is water. And uh, if we change that medium, you might see a different result. Uh, so there's an experiment that we'd, we'd want to uh, attempt. Um, as, as you would know, though, the only thing I'm concerned about is off-gassing and different solvents have more toxicity that I'm con I would be concerned about. But um, certainly working with the professors at Trinity, they could probably come up with helpful suggestions on different types of solvents that wouldn't be quite so uh, rambunctious. Uh, Jack, from my, from my side, I think the first point is not to use the water in the first place because of all the contamination that goes with that. So I, I would say just um, be, because you have such a large supply of, um, of plastics in the first place, is at source. So once it's thrown away, that's where separation should start off with. In, uh, in a lot of the Scandinavian countries, the way that they do that is they actually have uh, bins that are specifically color-coded for the different types of plastics. And on a weekly basis, they actually collect those plastics. Uh, in, and in some cases, they're actually in their own bins or own plastic uh, containers. They then get sent to um, recycling units where, according to color, it's, it's kicked out into its own bin. And then it can be separated that way. So I think um, I wouldn't use a solvent. I, wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't use water. It's a waste of the water to start off with. It's contaminating water. It just creates another problem to have to deal with. Uh, I would I would start at source. Well, I totally to agree with that. that. But it, we, we've got this huge problem that needs to be attacked immediately. And uh, getting to the point where you train all the people. I mean, we're just now using waste composting. But uh, truthfully, it takes a long time to convert a whole population. That's the problem that I've noticed as well. Is is um, It's a big ship to turn around. Uh, but... On the other hand, we've seen great shifts in public perception of plastic just since the mid to, you know, since four or five years ago. And, and communities across Canada are, are, are banning plastic. We've seen this happen. So there is a, a fast shift happening, but we do need the leadership of the young people to push that along at a faster pace. Oh, I agree with you on that. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. Um, you guys talked about the compostable plastic, that new trend that's been going around where we go to the, the cafes and they have those plastic-looking cups that are compostable. I'm wondering 
what your opinion is on that. Is that something that we should transition to fully? Is it working? Are they just being thrown out anyways? Mm -hmm. And actually composting it, does it work? Because I, I wouldn't put it in a compost at my home, right? And then have to put it in a compost. But like us recycling plastics, does it just get thrown in the garbage and burned anyways? Uh, well, uh, maybe I can start with the answer there and to maybe uh, follow on from there. Some of the research that we're doing in terms of um, looking to see what happens to those plastics is that these plastics that are being called biodegradable or compostable um, Primarily because people don't really know, they haven't been educated enough, and I think it's very important that the education is there. Um, they, they end up throwing them away anyway, thinking, oh, well, this is recyclable. The result is that it gets into the environment. Some of the plastics are meant to degrade um, biodegradably, they end up getting to, into the water systems, and they only degrade at very, uh, very much different conditions than what your compostable device would be. The result is that they actually again, are contaminating the water systems. Uh, the question then is, what do, what do we do? Right? Obviously, we need to, uh, where they're sold and places where they're disposed, people need to be aware, this is where that goes. And then there really needs to be a cleanup or, or pick up of those materials. One of the things that really, um, as my last point, that really disappointed me was, you see a lot of, even in this venue, you see these recycle bins and you go, yeah, yeah, I'm doing my bit, I'm throwing it away, it's going to be recycled. You anticipate that because now you're thinking, I'm, I'm being aware, I'm trying to do something good. It goes in the bin and then where it goes is back with the rest of the normal trash. And you're going like, why did I spend all that time separating or something that you're just going to put in with everything else? Why don't you actually do with it the, the purpose that you actually said, I'm going to recycle this. And that, I think, is something we need to start demanding from those people who are doing the recycling. Actually, recycle this. Don't just put it back in the landfill and say, so for my con uh, conscience sake, I think, oh, I've done my bit. I actually haven't. Because they're actually not doing their part. Yeah. And there's actually, oh, sorry. Yeah. There's actually um, um, a problem with capacity as well. There's, there's just too much of it to recycle. So really, when you think about it, this is an opportunity. This is a business opportunity. You know, your resources are free. You start your business and you bring in these resources for free. You just redirect them from wherever that truck's taking it to your factory and you can do something with it. So your, your starting point is free. Um, see, but I, I do worry about the biodegradable cups for this reason is it enables us. It makes us think, oh, well, then I don't have a problem. I just use it. In fact, I'll get another one. And so um, now I just continue to take my Instagram selfies with my bio biodegradable cup and um, thinking I'm doing a good thing. But the reality is it's just sort of perpetuating the problem. So um, I, I, I agree that it's just not actually biodegrading the way. In fact, I think the township of Langley uh, doesn't even accept it in the blue bin. Oh, sorry, it, oh, no, I want to clarify that. In the, uh, in the green bin. You'll see these biodegradable yeah. bags, and they won't accept them in the bio in the green bins in, in Langley. Oh, hi, Tim. It was um, very, very interesting to hear this whole thing. Um, first of all, I want to say that your comment about recycling being the last resort in that whole process is spot on. Um, I I muted you for a minute. And I ran and I told my husband and he's because my husband is the biggest recycler ever. And he's like, oh my gosh, he goes, I got to listen to the rest of this. So he listened to the rest of it too. Um, my question is, so I'm in the United States, you're in Canada, do different countries, do our different countries have different policies in place as far as regulating how the recycling or the repurposing process goes? Um, I know, you know, we have the same thing. We've got bins and recycling bins and we can't recycle this, but we can recycle this and the numbers on the plastics and all. But um, do you know of any similarities or differences? Well, I think the, the um, point that Shane made, you said in the U.S., the numbers for recycling in the 9, 10% range, whether it's the U.S. or Canada. And so that seems to be the case. Um, I I, so I don't know policies. I mean, the policies are different across our country from province to province. So I'm sure from country to country, they're going to also be, be different. But uh, everywhere you go, there's going to be a, a need for a reform and a progression and evolution of these policies uh, because uh, it, it's a problem that's international. 
it's not limited to one country. Um, but uh, Spain, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I don't know the specific policies, and, and thank you for the question. Um, but I do know that as far as uh, many of the European countries is concerned, the percentage of recycling is much higher than ours. And that must mean that their policies are stricter than, than ours. And I think we need to sit down and, and look and see what are they doing. Why are they being so, so successful? What could we be doing that would make us more successful in terms of, and then adapt our policies accordingly? But it, it, we don't have to wait for lawmakers to tell us, you know, by the way, you should be doing da da da. If you know that this is the right policy or the right practice, then start doing it yourself. Uh, get your institution, your university. Let's buy into that. How do we do that? How do we use this material more effectively? Even at Trinity, we throw away so much garbage. Where does that go? Is it incinerated? Is it recycled? What could we be doing as, as a university at home, where, where you're at, or your institution? What could you be doing? And I agree, I think, to come back to that in terms not only about law and legal reform, what, uh, what Tim was saying. These are little businesses. These are micro-businesses are waiting to happen. Somebody who's listening go, wow, I've got an idea. How do I do that? I've got a free resource. I can do something with it. I'm capturing the carbon. What can I do? So that it doesn't go back into that big cycle once again. Or it takes much longer to go back. In, by which time we might have a solution to what to do with that. Yeah. Julian is a brilliant teacher in Clearwater, Florida, an author, a publisher, an illustrator, and so we communicate quite a bit. And um, so I appreciate her coming in from, from Florida to join us here in Langley. But I, I do notice that here on Trinity campus, they've got a new Starbucks coming in, and uh, you, you know, you start right there. Uh, when they open up, like, what kind of cups are you guys going to be serving? Um, I'm sorry, we, we won't put up with single-use plastic cups. And uh, you've got to come up with an alternative to that and sort of force their hand a little bit. Uh, there's a brilliant company in um, Victoria. It's a micro business. You know what they do? They go around Victoria collecting the lids. The lids on, on coffee cups are um, polypropylene, uh, class five, and they are they're very moldable. They have a low melting point. And so this lady in Victoria is called Flipside Plastics. They're on Instagram. You can find them. She they they go around on bicycle collecting the lids, and they set up bins in every coffee shop. And then they grind them up with the, they've got the exact same machine that I've got. And they, they're making, uh, soap dish, soap dishes for your bathroom counter. And they're really quite attractive because they, they blend all the colors. And so you have all these different swirls and different colors, just like my plastic brick. And, um, and they've come up with a way to do it. And they're just bicycling around Victoria. It's brilliant. Why are more people doing this? Uh, is this is an opportunity waiting to happen. Thank you very much for the great talks. Uh, I do have a couple questions. Uh, so I'll say one, two questions and one comment. The uh, about the electric cars. Uh, I think it's similar to the previous question that came in. Um, if all of our cars that we see on the road right now were to switch to electricity, what would be the implication, in your view, for battery power, batteries that are necessary, their pollution, and where do we get all that electricity from? Uh, you know, this conversation happens in my life a lot. <laughs> and um, uh, the, a couple of things are, the batteries get a bad knock because of, um, the, let's say, the longevity. How, how are we going to recycle these batteries? Well, what we're noticing now is that these batteries don't yet need recycling. Do you know why? Because they're darn good. And they last and they last and they last. And, um, and they've already started looking into repurposing electric car batteries, which is an industry that hasn't really kicked off yet because there really are no electric car batteries waiting to be repurposed. Why? Because they're working still. Um, um, my, my car is a 2013 Nissan Leaf. Uh, it has 150,000 kilometers on it. It's got as, as good a battery capacity today as the day we bought it. And, um, but what they're working on now is uh, transferring the, the batteries from the cars into immobile storage. So when we move to, uh, like you're putting this new building here in Trinity, that Trinity, that brand new building, if it's truly going to be part of the 21st century, that building should be covered in solar panels. And in the basement of that building should be lithium ion batteries that have been repurposed from electric cars. That's going to store that battery because sunlight is intermittent. So when the, when the sun goes down or when the clouds roll in, I've still got battery uh, storage in, in the basement. Now, if we're truly going to talk 
uh, the talk, we've got to walk it. So why are there not solar panels all over this university? Uh, solar panels are one of the cheapest forms of energy, and you look at the graph that shows the cost of per, per watt, it's gone from uh, $20 a watt to like under a under dollar a watt over the last 20 years. So um, I, I just think that what's going to happen is um, electric cars will, 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 will move forward. I, I know there's issues. For instance, if we stop buying gasoline, uh, I stop paying. Like, I don't pay road tax. The gasoline collects a road tax. I don't pay it. Well, wait a minute. I, then how come I get to use the roads for free? When the potholes have to be filled, the bridges have to be built, they're still, they're still done, but I'm not paying for it. Why? Because I drive an electric car. Well, that's not really fair. So what if everybody's driving an electric car? Well, we just lost out on all that gas that's being collected to pay for these sort of things, our infrastructure. So that's an issue. So somehow or other, that, that, that tax base is going to have to migrate somewhere else. Somehow or other. And I'm not sure. I'm not the policymaker, but I know that's going to be an issue that has to be solved. The second question is in the, uh, and the third one is a comment. The second question is the area of aviation. Um, <laughs> aviation, I don't, I wouldn't take an electric plane. I don't know if anyone in the audience would take, do that either. Uh, I mean, unless, unless uh, there is a, some major development in that area, I don't know if, there is. and they're, they're the biggest polluter. I mean, <laughs> so that's an area that really needs development. Um I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Any, any. There, there's all kinds of development on it, and and you're finding that uh, there's already aviation companies that are building airplanes that are capable of carrying 100 people around 1,000 to 1,500 kilometers. Which means all your short hop flights, your regional airlines, Vancouver to Calgary, Vancouver to Prince George, Vancouver to Victoria, Vancouver to Seattle. I could do it all by electric. Now, not quite yet because the technology is still under testing. They're working on it. So, but this, these planes will be coming. Now, to fly to Hong Kong, I'm probably going to be on a jet fuel burning airplane. Uh, so, but we're going to, we're going to minimize our impact by switching where we can. So we do what we can, right? We can't do it all, uh, but we can do what we can. I do think, though, that there is huge room for biojet uh, fuel uh, that is being developed as well, not necessarily electric. So that's just another, I think it's not going to take just one option, electricity. It's going to be many options. I mean, being involved in IEA bioenergy, I think it's a big area where biojet is not just going to be electricity. It's going to be all, all the technologies working together to help the human race, essentially. Um, the last comment is in, uh, in composting. Uh, when we talked a lot about composting and some of the previous comments, one of the think the areas that are concerns that's coming up right now is that when composting goes anaerobic, uh, it becomes more uh, methane producing, and the methane, if you're not controlling it and collecting it, if you're collecting it, it's great, it's renewable natural gas. But uh, if it goes methane, say in people's yards all around, uh, and cows like to produce their own uh, share of methane as well, um, there's also that issue. So. It's something that people need to be aware of. I think that when your compost doesn't have enough air, uh, it, it can also become very bad because I believe the greenhouse effects of uh, impact of methane is, is far about 12 times worse than carbon dioxide. So, uh, so it's just something that just, that was just a comment. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the last question goes to Antoinette Guilou. Um I know Antoinette, she is a local advocate for reducing plastic waste, and she's on our uh, climate change group here in Langley, so looking forward to her question. Oh, well, thank you very much for your very interesting presentations. Um, I, I just wanted to go back to recycling, which I agree should be the very last alternative, but I do want to mention in terms of policy and our um, ability, um, British Columbia has one of the best recycling um, programs in North America. And we have the EPR program, which is the employer responsibility, um, which is very useful also. And we also have the Canada Plastic Pact, which they're, but unfortunately they're, they are focusing on recycling also. And one of um, the things that I found that's very annoying is the lack of urgency in our governments. We've tried, we've approached the municipal governments. They're waiting for the, for the um, provincial government to do something on banning single plastics. And the um, provincial government is waiting for the federal government, which is now, I've heard Trudeau say many times, has 
Um, we've banned plastics, but in actual fact, it hasn't happened yet. And it looks like straws might be banned, banned by the end of this year, but we're still looking at 2023 for the um, for future bannings, for, for, the, for the regulations to come into force. And I guess my question is, how do we create a sense of urgency with our governments to move a little faster on these? I'll maybe very quickly start, and I, I think it starts with us individually um, and our institutions and where we are. I, I think if we start um, demanding from the companies that are providing single-use plastics that we won't use them, uh, that will immediately send a ripple up. But equally, uh, to your representatives in your area, sending letters, um, uh, uh, starting petitions, um, and letting your, your voice be, be heard, I think that's where it's going to start. But I agree with you. I think the, the sense of urgency of where we're at is just, um, okay, uh, we're going to wait for the pandemic to end before we do this. Um, when is that going to happen? I think it has to start from, start from grassroots up. But we also need our leaders to, to take cognizance of what's going on. Um, and also globally around the world, the, the plastic problem um, supersedes their, their lifestyle. Like these people in certain countries, their, their number one mission in life is to survive till tomorrow. Food and shelter. And if, if plastic is being used out of convenience, they're just not going to think in terms of, well, I better recycle this. Because they're really just worried about making it till tomorrow. And so some of the greatest plastic polluters are some of the third world countries that really just need, they need infrastructure. So they do need people to go and help to set up these sort of facilities. We're, we're living in a country that this shouldn't even be a, 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 com, a conversation. Why do we have to convince anybody in Canada that plastic is a problem? That's ridiculous. But I will tell you this much. Um, uh, I've, I've had the, the opportunity over the last four, four years or five years or so. Um, one of my greatest contacts I ever made was with Mark Warwa, who unfortunately has passed away now. Well, what a brilliant man that was. he was. And he was very, very concerned about the environment. And he would sit down with you at the drop of a hat and talk about these things, and he would take exactly what you say right to Ottawa. you got to meet these people. The person I would recommend right now is uh, John Aldeg. John Aldeg is the MP for uh, Langley City and Cloverdale. And he's, he's, a, he's a father of one of the students in our school. And um, she, he is uh, very willing to sit down. You could call him up and say, hey, look, uh, Tim Stevenson said I should call you and you'll take me for coffee. I want to talk about plastic pollution. He'd probably say, no problem, let's go. Where do you want to meet? He'd probably meet you here. He's a good guy, and he'll listen to you. And so we, there are, uh, even though it's federal politics, they are, they are people. They're individuals who live in our community, and they're, they are willing to sit and listen and talk. But you've got to reach out to them, and you've got to make, take that step. And, um, and I've done that, and, I, and we, they need to hear from more people. Great. Thanks, Antoinette. I know Antoinette has been trying these kind of things to try to reach our local politicians, but that's more encouragement for you, Antoinette to uh, wait until they, they listen, and certainly the presentations we heard today really underline how urgent the situation is, and that we just need to start doing things about it. And uh, I'm gonna call up Natalie Ross, who's gonna explain a way that hopefully some of us will be taking advantage of a chance to do something about it this afternoon. So Natalie Ross is the president of the Trinity Western Environment Club, and also, we have <laughs> Haley here, who's the president of the Biology Club. So um, they've been working on this project for this afternoon. Thank you. I just want to thank everyone for showing up and to Dr. Ross and uh, for talking today. It was, I loved it. It was very good. Yeah. Right. Um, so to continue um, the day and about plastic pollution, we're going to actually be um, doing a garbage cleanup event at 1 p.m. We do have shirts. Um, yeah, we'd love <laughs> to give these out to you guys. I think and I'll tell you what, you, whatever plastic you pick up, bag it up and give it to me. We'll grind it and we'll give it to Mr. Uh, Dr. Durbach <laughs> to do his experiments Yay. with. So it's a beautiful <laughs> circular thing here. So just hang on to it and I'll grind it. Great. Thanks, Natalie. Um, before we thank our speakers one more time, I want to also give thanks to the guy in the back, Mark McEwen, who has run all the technical stuff. And thank you, Mark. Thank you.
and also uh, thank you to the four students, we just one left here, um, who are assisting us. The others are down at the lunch area, but Elise and uh, Edison and Natalia and Ruth were very helpful. So uh, thanks everyone and thanks to our speakers again.